Hi, today I'm going to discuss a mineral, flint, and its use by people throughout history. I wish I could talk about the art of napping flint, but I'm not experienced in it, and I don't feel qualified to discuss the craft itself. Geologists and archaeologists debate a little bit on the definition of flint. Here I'll present my take on the matter. Also, please bear in mind that due to the vast scale of the topic, I'll be painting quite large brush strokes. Flint is a hard, tough, biosedimentary material. It's 95% pure silicon dioxide, which makes it a form of microcrystalline quartz. Structurally, it's a fine mosaic of colloidal silica, which is opal, and cryptocrystalline silica, which is chalcedony. It's seven on the most scale of mineral hardness, which is equivalent to hardened steel, with mild steel coming out at 4.5 on the same scale. The flint is obviously not as tough as steel, though. Flint conchoidally fractures like glass, but is tougher than glass, a property that makes it ideal for stone tool manufacture. This is a piece of English black flint. You can see the chalk cortex on one side, and this is a piece from Sweden that's mottled with a light grey, dull, coarser, grainier material that I'd call chert. Flint is a type of chert, which has many varieties. Your garden variety chert can form in any limestone, while flint is found specifically in chalk. Flint is normally of a higher quality, with finer grains and a glassier finish than ordinary chert. Agate is an interesting variant of banded silica, in that it forms in many kinds of rock, primarily volcanic rocks. So how does flint form? Chalk beds were formed on the floor of ancient oceans, and consist of crystal plates of calcium carbonate originating from the bodies of a microscopic sea creature called a coccolithophore. These plates eventually form a bed of white mud on the seafloor, which will contain dead sea creatures, animal burrows, and other features. Over time, these ancient seabeds solidified into solid chalk. And dissolved silica, the exact source is uncertain, maybe from sponges and plankton, filled the cavities in the chalk and hardened, forming nodules of flint in the shape of animal burrows and now fossilized sea creatures. My grandfather found a beautiful flint nodule that had formed inside a sea urchin with all the features of the inside of the shell like this one. I'm sorry I don't have his here to show you. The first evidence of the use of flint tools dates back roughly 1.65 million years ago. A tool type called Older One B, which is essentially a cobble with a few flakes removed to produce a sharp edge. The Older One tool culture goes back even further, used by the later Australopithecines, but the hominid populations didn't gain access to chert and flint sources until a certain point in time. When they did, the excellent napping properties of flint allowed their primitive stone tools to become slightly more sophisticated. As time passed, stone tools became more refined, fully shaped and retouched, not just sharpened cores. This tool culture is called Acheulean, and tools of this type can be found across Africa, Asia and Europe. It's commonly associated with Homo erectus. Flint was heavily used for Acheulean tools in Western Europe due to the extensive chalk beds there. But realistically, the simple shapes involved can be created using any number of different materials, and they would have used whatever's locally available. 200,000 years ago, the Neanderthals came onto the scene, a physically powerful, cold-adapted subspecies of human whose range extended from Spain in the west to Kazakhstan in the east, and as far south as the Sinai. Their tools were made using the Levelois technique, which allows greater control of the size and shape of the resulting flake, the core will be formed and shaped carefully, and then the desired flake struck off at the core, creating what's called a tortoise core, with multiple flake scars on one face and a single large flake scar on the other. These tools are called Mousterian tools, and were normally made from flint. Modern humans also use this technique, but our ancestors took stone tool technology far further, producing prismatic blades using pressure flaking, and creating absolute works of art in stone. Here's an example of a long flint blade. And now I'll show some examples from around the world. Starting with Denmark. Here we have a flint adze head, a useful woodworking tool. Here's an ornate flint knife. 
And here, shown during an archaeological excavation for the Fairman Belt Tunnel Scheme, a flint axe with its wooden handle still intact. Moving to Germany, we have an example of a flint spearhead. These examples of flint knives are from Egypt. And these arrowheads are from China. Crossing to the New World, these are Clovis projectile points, used by the early settlers of North America for hunting mammoths. Moving southwards, we have an example of an extremely ornate flint knife made by the Mayans. Now, stone tools are really neat, but in most parts of the world, metallurgy would eventually bring an end to flint's importance as a material for tools and weapons. I say eventually because flint was still widely used for tools in the Bronze Age. For example, Tecpatl were flint sacrificial daggers used by the Aztecs, who were a Bronze Age culture when the Spanish conquistadors arrived. So macabre. The knife even looks thirsty. The Iron Age would reveal a new use for flint. Due to flint's hardness and ability to hold a sharp edge, when struck against the steel, the flint can cut away tiny sparks of iron, hot enough to ignite tinder. The tinder box would become the go-to tool for fire starting, wherever flint and steel could be found. The property is not unique to flint. Other hard stones will yield a similar effect. For example, agate. This example is a replica of a Norse fire steel. Unfortunately, I don't have a nice sharp piece of flint I can use here, but maybe we can get a few sparks for you with this bit. With a decent sharp piece of flint, I could do better. So you can start a fire with it, and it makes great arrowheads. If Minecraft was a historical guide, that's where we'd stop talking about flint. Luckily it's not, so I'll continue. Flint can be quite beautiful, as was apparent from some of those tools. This meant it was also used in jewellery and decoration. Like this Egyptian bracelet from the Fitzwilliam Museum. Parts of the world where flint is abundant generally sit on massive thick deposits of chalk. While this means you have lots of lovely flint at hand, and are able to make pretty white horses on hillsides by chopping away the topsoil, it does limit the options for an individual wanting to build a stone building. As a result, many buildings in these areas were made using local flint cobbles, rather than paying to bring quarried stone from elsewhere. Here's some examples from England. This is part of Castle Acre Monastery in Norfolk. This is a section of wall from the Roman fort in Richborough, Kent. This is St. Mary de Castro, the Saxon church inside Dover Castle. In a more ornate use for flint, a checkering effect has been achieved here using flints at the King's Lynn Town Hall, also in Norfolk. The same use what's ever cheap and local principle also applied to shipbuilding. Flint cobbles were often used as ballast in shipyards located where flint was plentiful. Southeast England, for example. This may become important later. Flint was, and in some places still is, used in glass making and ceramics. Flint pebbles were used in the grinding of glaze mixes, and ground flint itself is an ingredient that can be added to both the body and glaze of a ceramic to reduce cracking from shrinkage. In glass making, since flint was a source of silica, it could be used as a raw material. This here is what we'd call lead crystal nowadays. But an old name for it was flint glass, because it was made from a mixture of ground flint and lead oxide. In the mid-16th century, the Snaphance lock for firearms was invented. At the time, military muskets were ignited using the matchlock system, which had a metal arm drop a smouldering match into the flash pan. Simple system, but with the inherent problems of safety and vulnerability to wet weather. If you had the money, you could pay a master craftsman to make your wheel lock firearm. A wheel lock didn't rely on a match, rather it ignited the charge using a spring-loaded steel wheel and a chunk of iron pyrite, a uh, fool's gold. But these were too complicated and expensive for mass production for the various European militaries. Snap answers were not a lot simpler than wheel locks, but nevertheless, they were gradually taken up by European armies eager to find a replacement for matchlocks. 
The flintlock mechanism was a simpler, more rugged version of the snap hunts. Gone was the individually sliding flash pan cover. It was engineered into the frizzin itself instead. The flintlock musket would rapidly become the weapon of choice across Europe. With the widespread use of flints by armies, for the first time since the Bronze Age, flint had become a strategic resource again. I have a couple of examples of gun flints here. This larger example would be for a musket, while a smaller one would be suitable for a pistol. This is a tool that someone would carry with them to dress their gun flints, keep them sharp. If the flint and frizzin are well maintained, a flintlock will fire quite reliably. As an aside, it's quite strange how technology transforms the importance of certain resources. Out of context, it would seem ridiculous to most modern people that goose feathers and pigeon droppings were at certain points in time considered resources of national importance in England. But it makes perfect sense when you understand that they were the key materials required for the manufacture of longbow arrows and gunpowder, respectively. Flintlock firearms were the primary weapons for soldiers in many world conflicts. For example, the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars. Here in New Zealand, the musket wars raged for two decades, having catastrophic consequences for many Māori iwi, generally those without access to flintlock muskets, who faced raids and invasions by those who did. New Zealand has no natural sources of flint. Only a few local chirts and Māori who were unable to purchase English gun flints took to salvaging flint cobbles from the ballast of shipwrecks in order to make their own. All these wars made gun flint production a serious priority for the nations involved. Flint napping, an ancient craft going back over a million years, became industrialised. Brandon in Suffolk is considered to have the best quality flint of anywhere in England and it became the heart of Britain's gunflint industry, supplying the armies and navies that would build the British Empire. During the Napoleonic Wars, one Brandon gunflint manufacturer was supplying the Board of Ordnance with 356,000 gunflints a month. By 1815, the Brandon flint manufacturers were producing between 800,000 and 1.14 million gunflints per month. This mass production of gunflints was devastating to the health of the flint nappers involved. Just as coal miners suffer from black lung, miners and flint nappers suffer from silicosis, also called... Uh, yeah, not even going to try to say that. Fine particles of silica, when inhaled, creates tiny cuts in the lungs, and the body then forms scar tissue over the piece of silica, which then cuts the scar tissue creating more scar tissue. And since scar tissue doesn't function as lung tissue, breathing becomes more and more difficult. It was called consumption at the time, and it wasn't until 1894 that the British government acknowledged silica as the cause. The mining of flint for tens of thousands of years has left scars on the landscape. This site is Grimes Graves in Norfolk, an enormous flint mining complex near Brandon. Chemistry would ultimately spell the end of flint's importance to world militaries and to its civilian use as a fire starter. The early 19th century saw much experimentation with alternatives to flintlock ignition for firearms, which would culminate in the invention of the copper percussion cap, a tiny copper cap containing a small amount of shock-sensitive explosive, such as fulminate of mercury. Like the plastic caps on toy cap guns today, these caps created a small explosion, which was used to ignite the main charge of the firearm. Percussion caps are still in use in modern firearms today, They're now called primers and can be found in the bottom of any centre fire cartridge. The invention of friction matches would make fire starting easier than ever. While earlier match designs exist, such as the Promethean match, which required the match to be immersed in sulfuric acid, true friction matches using white phosphorus would become popular from the 1830s, gradually being replaced with safety matches from the 1850s on. Today, there's relatively little demand for flint except by stonemasons, black powder enthusiasts, and people interested in the art of flint napping. The flints used in modern lighters and in the flint and steel sets sold as campers are actually ferrocerium, an alloy of iron, misc metal, and magnesium. And these flints work in the opposite manner to an actual flint and steel. 
Rather than the flint striking sparks of metal off the steel, the modern version has the steel striking sparks off the ferrocerium. On a personal note, I've always been interested in flint napping, but living here in New Zealand with no natural flint available, I've never been able to pursue it. I know of a handful of chert sources around the country, but they're all protected archaeological sites, making raiding them for raw materials quite illegal. I hope this video has served to illustrate the use of an interesting and useful material throughout human history and all around the world. Thank you for watching, and please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers!